words and after that can invite our guest speaker thank you all for being here uh especially a warm welcome for our new cohort of postdoctoral candidates who start with their program activities this month actually 13 candidates from the Netherlands, Spain, Mexico, Ecuador, Cyprus, Argentina, Turkey, and Albania were admitted to the program as newly admitted candidates. This is, guys, your first ESI masterclass and online event. Some of you have already received uh, research advisors for your research topics, and the rest will receive their advisors until the end of this month. For those of you who already have advisors, I would really like to ask you to get in touch with the advisor, sending them emails and schedule at least two online meetings within the next two months. We are also preparing the working groups and each one of you will participate in one of the four working groups and will work on a joint topic together with other postdoctoral fellows. In order to obtain you already know this but i would like to mention again in order to obtain the certificate for program completion you will have to provide your proactiveness in the process and participate actively during the esi master classes the work group meetings and the meetings with your advisors finally each one of the candidates will make two weeks research visit at one of the 12 host universities affiliated to this program i would like to mention that during the first half of May this year, we will have a research visit with a full program at the University of Catania in Italy. And in the second half of May and the first week of June, the research visit at the University of La Laguna in Tenerife, Spain. All of you, except for those that will make their regular research visit there, all of you are invited to join there and network in person meet up in person with your colleagues and students from those universities and coming from all around the globe. Last but not least, uh, you should, as part of the program, you should keep your academic level of communication and be respectful to your colleagues, advisors, working group chairs, and the program directors and invited speakers, of course. And I really hope, hope that um, all of you will successfully complete the process within the next 15 months. That's all from me. Uh, now what I would like to invite our speaker who will deliver her master class for today. Uh, her name is Dr. Viola Hjoiter. I hope I pronounced well the, the surname. She is... Um, a rector at the University of Aruba, uh, one of the partner universities of ESI, her affluent um, uh, CV. I'll try to briefly present. Uh, she was appointed uh, a rector at the University of Aruba in 2021, in July. And uh, previously, she served as visiting professor at several, several universities in um, the Netherlands, in Belgium in Budapest, uh, Austria, in Hungary, Austria, Italy, and so on. She is a lawyer and during her uh, abundant career, she served as an advisor to legislative uh, committees in various countries, including Surin uh, Suriname, Curacao, Kosovo, and Poland. And her motivation and aim as a rector of the university is uh, to provide an innovative and open-minded minded approach of the university and uh, be receptive and open to knowledge and welcoming new ideas. I really believe that we will have a um, great and we have a great opportunity to hear her wisdom today. Hello, Viola, the floor is yours. You can use the share screen option and uh, try to uh, present your knowledge and your ideas in front of this uh, multicultural uh, audience who are eager to, to listen to you. Thank you very much for the kind words. 
I'm sitting here on Aruba, also in a different time zone. We have it in the morning. I'm looking outside into the sun and a lot of trees and I listen to some yeah, birds. So good to see you. I read you always in good evening. So I think you're in the Vienna time zone, some already some also somewhere else. For me, it's very special to be here and to be in a postdoc program as we on Aruba are still striving to have postdocs as such. It's our big dream and nearly every month I'm sitting with the Minister of Education telling him what is the concept of a postdoc as that is so new to us. Therefore, I think it's good for you to know where we are here. I am now the rector at a small university in the Caribbean Sea. It's an island close to the Venezuelan coast. We have some 100, 120,000 inhabitants and we completely yeah, have as a fundament of our economy tourism. 90% of all incomes come from tourism. And uh, yeah, you will find all five star hotels, you know, from the Hilton to the Marriott to, yeah, you can't imagine, Holiday Inn. So we are only consisting out of, ho of hotels for our economy. Yeah, to have a, a pillar in education is new to the island. And that's also why it's so important to have a university. When I give you some figures, we have only some 2% of people living on Aruba with a university degree, 2%. Normal European countries had that in their late 60s, 70s, and have now much higher percentages. Then we have some people who visited the University of Applied Science and you fulfilled a bachelor program, nearly 10%, but still the figures in academic education are very, very low. And that's where we are here on the island really are fighting for to, to bring people to the island, to keep them and to build the capacity of those people on the island. Because before, when there was no university here, people were sent to study abroad. Normally they went to the Netherlands, few, especially in the medical sector, went to the US. And out of 10, at a maximum one person was returning. So nine intelligent people were lost for the island. That caused a lot of problems because then you always had yeah, to buy in people who help out for a certain time, but never be part of the community. So for a long time then from the neighboring island, Curaçao, which was also earlier part of the Netherlands Antilles, there was yeah, a part of the lectures of the law faculty were also offered on Aruba. That was for a long, long time, time until the, eight, a, yeah, the year 19, 1988, and then the university was funded. At that time, Aruba became an independent state within the kingdom. And now to make it more complex, I also hear that there's one scholar from the Netherlands. We have the kingdom of the Netherlands and that consists out of five different parts. We have one part who is the Netherlands, you know, with Amsterdam, with The Hague, part of the European Union. But to that part in the Netherlands, also three small islands belong with some 25, 28,000 people living in Bonaire, Zaba and St. Eustatius. But those people on these three islands are like a community in the Netherlands, but not European Union. And then since the year 2010, there are three islands who earlier were colonies and part of the Netherlands and the least, and now independent states within the kingdom. And that are the island St. Martin, which is part Half of the island is French and part of the island is Dutch. The Dutch part is not part of the European Union, but part of the Kingdom of the Netherlands. Then we have uh, another island, which is an independent state within the kingdom, that's Curaçao, a bigger state than Aruba. And then we have Aruba, where I'm based, and that's also part of the kingdom, but not of the European Union. So for legal scholars, it's a paradise. As within this kingdom of the Netherlands, you have five different legal regimes. There's always something to investigate. That's perfect. That's also why we need postdocs, not only in that sector. On the other hand, we are a very vulnerable, small developing state. 
with, you can imagine, so many hotels, also including all-inclusive, a lot of waste. And we don't have the uh, possibilities like in Europe to have, yeah, really waste management. We have a big hill where we always put everything on it and then we make a fire. So not really that you think this fits to the first class tourism we have on the other side of the island. And then we also realize that all managing positions normally taken by, by American people or by Dutch people. Therefore, there was a strong need in, to establish a university. But when you have no comparison, it's very hard to define your quality. And that's also where we struggle very often because we don't have enough people with an academic degree on the island. However, we want to educate as many people. And so the university was starting. In the beginning, mainly as an yeah, education institution. So we started also mainly with bachelor programs. Then lately some master programs were added. Then some PhD programs were added. But also then, yeah, how to teach when you only can afford a very small amount of staff who is stable there and you don't have all the capacity on the island. So first we always look for every subject we, we teach. Is there a person already among the staff? So we also teach cross faculty, really using all skills a person has. And then we look, is there any, any person on the island who could or probably become a part-timer? And then we look all around the world and fly in people. Last year, we had some 75 guest lecturers from all over the world, from Canada, from the US, from Switzerland, from Germany, from Netherlands. Yeah, so that's for us also from Italy, a fantastic occasion to offer our students this experience of an international classroom, even when you probably have never left the island. That's also something what you would not expect on such a high scale tourism sector island that many, many of our students at the university have never ever left the island because we are a small development island with yeah, a very low income. I checked it with my Italian colleagues and they said, okay, you're exactly like people 35 kilometers in the south of Naples. So we have a little bit that equivalence, really the uh, rural version in the south of Italy, that's a little bit comparable from the financial and economic situation when you like to have some reference in Europe. So then we are flying in all these people, but then we also realized for our students, it's sometimes yeah, overwhelming as we also switch a lot of languages here. We are a multilingual island where people at home for 90% speak Papiamento where the administrative language and the language of instruction is mainly Dutch, which nobody speaks at home. And the tourism and the labor field language is at this moment mainly English. However, as you know, the situation in Venezuela is very tough, also in Haiti, in Jamaica. We have a lot of people who come here to work with the papers, without papers, and an estimate is that around some 30 to 40,000 people are on the island yeah, who speak Spanish. So Spanish became a more and more important language. And also we now made a survey with our students, some 30% speak at home next to Papiamento also Spanish. And then you are there at the university and you try to stick to this yeah, artificial Dutch, which is the administrative language, the language of the law, but yeah, which is not an active language. It's really something of the books. Here I have the, the legislation of Aruba for the civil code. Then here I have uh, yeah, constitutional law. All that is in Dutch, but only it's a passive language. You read it. Yeah, I also speak it. And then you have to train our students. They come from schools, from Papiamento and Dutch. We offer here different tracks in either Dutch when we teach, for example, law, or economy, because even there, the reports for the audits are still in Dutch and all other subjects like engineering and uh, governance studies, social work and uh, hotel management that we teach in English. And then our students enter the labor field and they have to speak Spanish or English and Papiamento again. So it's for us very tricky to find adequate people and also when we fly in people that it really match with our students coming from a different background. 
That's also why we started a very strong partnership with Erasmus, as it also made our experience in class more vivid, as it's good not only have the teacher from abroad, but also in the class, your students from very different backgrounds. At this moment, we even have a student here from Greenland. You must imagine that, Greenland in the Caribbean on an island, really a temperature shock. And we have at this moment students from South Carolina, from Belgium, from Germany. So that's really, and from Sweden, that really enriched our classroom. Some 40 students are here at the moment. Normally some 5% of our yeah, student population comes from abroad. We have some 850 students. But also there we realized that most students, because of your background in migration with a Spanish speaking mom who has probably three jobs in the morning in the hotel, in the afternoon at private houses, in the evening another cleaning job. Yeah, most of our kids had not had the attention as we would give it to children in, in Europe, for example. And our schools also struggle as not always all teachers which you would need are there, or the teachers are not educated for the level in which they teach. They come, for example, for, for classes up to 12 years, but then there is no teacher for those who would like to go to university. So the same teacher then tries his best and teaches the children. So when our students come to university, we must honestly state they have a lot of deficiencies. On the one end, on, in the language area, but also in some yeah, areas like the mathematics or chemistry, as there was not the right teacher or not the laboratory at the university. And that was a big, big struggle as we realized that we had a high dropout and a lot of students who studied very, very long. And on the other hand, we also got the feedback from those students who went to the Netherlands that the numbers of those who got a degree were incredibly low. I will now share the figures with you. A student who leaves Aruba and wants to study at the University of Applied Science has a rate of success of 17%. So 83% go there and will never come back with a degree. When they go to university, it's a little bit better, 37% manage to get a degree. But even there, some 63% have no degree, but a lot of debts. Because our students normally don't have any financial means by their parents for their studies. They can get a loan from the island and a loan from the Netherlands. And yeah, I'm also here in charge of human resources. And very often I accept a new staff member and then, yeah, we also speak about salary, about their debts, etc. And when you come back with a master degree and you had no financial help on your family, it's normally 120,000 euro of debts. And those who come back with the bachelor normally have some 80,000 euro debts. That's enormous. And therefore, we don't offer the salaries to ever pay this back. So it's very, very difficult for us on the one hand to get these people back, but also gives them the chance to make a living here with their European debts coming back from studies. So also on that we work, how we can settle that and also train our students that probably when you go to the Netherlands, you should have a very spartanic lifestyle in order to come back with less debts. And that's why we started some five years ago, what we call an academic foundation year to prepare students better for the skills you need to live, but also for the skills you need to study. And we tried to make that program like a very tough, strong study. So it's a pre-academic program. It's one year, it's called Academic Foundation Year. It's 60 ECTS, so a full program. And there, they have one component for 30%, it's really skills. All those students, I can stand up and present whatever you, you want them. Those people learned to speak the four languages we use here and can follow up to two classes in Spanish and English in Pacamento and Dutch. And those students get seven weeks of law, seven weeks of economy, seven weeks of philosophy. And we fly in people from all over the world, but also many people from the working field in the area. They learn tourism management. They can do a short internship. And we realized that helped enormous because these people 
are much stronger as personalities. We also have classes, what is my cultural identity? What is to have a multiple identity when you are partly Chinese, partly Surinamese, partly from Marons? And because, yeah, we barely have any student who has two sets of grandparents born on the island. Most come from migrant families. And some struggle that they are also different. When you would see a picture of my students, yeah, you see all colors, you see everything. We are so mixed. And that also is the identity here. You have probably German roots, Spanish roots, Venezuelan roots, or you come from the English speaking islands because in until the 70s in Aruba, we had a refinery. And many, many people were working in this refinery, oil refinery. And there were so many workers needed that they came from all over. So we have a big mixture of the population, but still from that time, we still have a strong English speaking community. So the third generation of those workers at the, we call it Lago, the refinery. And then those who came recently. So a big mixture and this brain gain and a university which was fund, founded, but mainly for teaching. And after some years they realized, oh, there is no yeah, growing in the university because yeah, you delivered a lot of bachelor students, but you didn't have the capacity you now for own master students. And for own master students, you would also need PhDs to teach them. And after PhDs, you would like to give people yeah, some future as a postdoc. So we really built a university up from scratch. First it was teaching, then we had the first master students, and then we invested that our people do their PhD. But that was in the beginning mainly that they were based here teaching a lot and then more or less in their free time next to work without any yeah, tutoring, mentoring on the island, doing it in the Netherlands. So in Groningen, in Utrecht, but that's very tough. And many people had to burn out, suffered, didn't felt be understood. And that also made us think, yeah, we should have a kind of yeah, PhD school, it should be more, more guided. You can't leave a person alone and say, now write your PhD. And then we had a strong partner, started a strong partnership, which was really amazing that that was possible. We applied for European funding. So my big, big thank you again to the European Union and the University of Leuven who said, yeah, we want to partner in this unique project with an integrated holistic view on teaching, research, capacity building. And we started our system program that's so silent, that is the sustainable island solutions through engineering, mathematics, science. And there we needed strong partners. As beforehand, we only had law, economy, but nothing in the engineering sector. And the University of Leuven was willing to cooperate. And together with them, we designed two European programs. One was for teaching and research. And one was for, make, for renovating a building that these new people also have a housing because we are in an old monastery, which also far too small. We teach here from in the morning, eight o'clock until nine o'clock in the evening and also on Saturdays. And you will never see any classroom which is not filled because we are really a logistic master as we really use every single room. We have 11 classrooms, seven programs and yeah, bachelor master studies who have some three to four years and one and two years. So that's also very tricky. And then we started this cooperation with Leuven. And that was on the one hand, the design of a bachelor program, the design of a master program. But in order to teach the bachelors, we started with a PhD school. And some 10 PhD students started, got a lot of training also in Leuven, also how to teach. That was two years long, only training 10 PhD students. And together with this body of 10 very motivated young people and two yeah, senior researchers, we started this new study in sustainable engineering two years later. And all these people had immediately to start to teach. And out of that, then four years later, we rolled out a first master program. But you can probably imagine, yeah, when you are so new in a subject and you have to focus on your PhD and teach bachelors. Yeah, unfortunately, so far, not one, no one of the PhDs has finished in time. 
And now we have again the problem with the masters that we have to fly in people to teach the master. But however, this year, I hope the first PhD will finally graduate. But then you see also how fragile all these structures are in a small setting. Yeah, because yeah, you have to do it with the people you have. But on the other hand, you like to meet international standards. And we, or our ministers of education, we have four ministers of education for the different parts within the kingdom, they agreed some years ago that each of the studies we offer will have an accreditation. And if possible, the Dutch accreditation, that's the Netherlands, Vlaamse Organisatie, and the NPO. And that was then also, yeah, for us, such a challenge, as we don't have a lot of support stuff. And our support staff normally has not the academic background. And then you have only teaching staff. And probably some of you already know how much paperwork is an accreditation and how much things you need to describe and how many people must be trained. So that was the next burnout problem when we had not only PhDs, but then also this yeah, administrative task burden on all the teachers to do the accreditation. In the meantime, yeah, we also have some yeah, quality assurance. When I came, there was nearly nothing and only a single lady who also did the mental health program. And then I completely started from scratch how to teach, how to train the trainers, let's say. So every person who's lecturer now has to follow course courses in teaching and examination, in presenting, in digitalization, in leadership and so on. We have now, we call it the full alphabet of, uh, of courses, ABC. And uh, in the beginning, people were very reluctant and said, oh, I'm so already so overloaded and no, no, no. But at a certain moment, only after half a year, people were so enthusiastic as they realized, wow, I become more efficient, I feel stronger, and I get to know people from other faculties that I never mixed, mixed before. And now we really have a, yeah, a quality movement and everybody is looking, when is the next course coming? And now we also offer a, we'll offer a course on research, but then really on the applied research you need for your teaching and also on these skills. So it's really now a very vivid community. And we also give out the RH fund certificates, have a small reception, even invites the press. As for this island with only 2% of academic trained people, this means such a lot. And now also this idea of permanently studying is really visible and yeah, people like to participate. We also have a lifelong learning center, which is very important to us, where we offer for the professionals on the island courses in, in, yeah, in gaining insights, what's going on in the world, what are the standards there? And we also would like to invite men, as many people as we can come to the university for lectures. Tonight, for example, I will host the meeting of three of our alumni who started their own business. And they will present their results, but also say, yeah, we would like to give back. This university changed our life. One of the ladies tonight, she started as a, oh no, I don't know the, as a hairdresser, as a hairdresser without any, proper school, let's say, to enter university. But she was so motivated that she asked if she cannot join the program as a person only listening, not participating in exams, anything. So she was following, yeah, as a silent participant for years, the courses. Then she asked if she not per course may try the exam. Then she did excellent exams. And then we had to, yeah, we have something what we call colloquium doctum. So I mean, you later show that you have certain skills in Dutch and mathematics and history, or when you show us that you really yeah, have studied different certificates, they say, okay, then you have the level and we have some possibilities. We are the exam committee, very, very reluctantly to let some of these people in. And when they then perform in track, they can stay. And this lady did so and finally graduated. And this really was for her life changing. And also they are giving such a boost. And she now found to other people with the same experience and they will present tonight. And I think that are the possibilities on the island, especially for those students first generation who come from families where nobody studied. And then you enter one day the university, you enjoy in the beginning the atmosphere, and then you became 
we are obsessed to be part of it. And we have many of these people who really work at the police and then their, their boss finally realized, you're much too clever, go on. And then we have this possibility that they can also enter university and in our law program, I have now a bunch of policemen and also in our master for, for um, yeah, leadership and governance. And then I think it's a success story of universities that you also yeah, look around you, where are these hidden talents because of their economic backgrounds, their families, they would never have seen a university. And we try to get them, but it also, but therefore we also have a completely different student population. For example, when you look to our law students, you would wonder, wow, what is that kind of mixture? Because you have very few who come directly from school, but you have a big group who is whatever, police officer, or we have the inspector of all the uh, doctors, and uh, some people who work at the custom, who work at the port authority. So I think the, the age would be 34 to 37, if you would break it. But we have some people above 40, we have some about 60, then we have some very young one, and they all learn together. And that was also for us, yeah, what kind of teaching you offer. Because when you do it then very traditional, I tell a story, they listen. Yeah, you don't get them because for the young, they feel a little bit frightened. The older ones have already such many stories they want to share. And so we really have this problem-based teaching that we really just yes, study cases together, do a lot of role games, mood courts, in order really to get out all the talents of our students and also strong focusing on their skills. And so that's also what we have here, but also we have different level of studies. We have, uh, yeah, I don't know if you all have in your countries you splitting about university academic and university of applied science. And in, the, in America, we don't know that. So we have also one integrated program, which is accredited to American standards, our tourism and hotel management studies. And then we have university of applied science, like economy and social work, which are really people in the applied science sector for the labor field. And then we have these strong academic programs like our engineering program, which will really bring a change to the island in waste management, in nutrition, in many, many areas. And then we have a very a traditional law faculty because we have own court system, we have own legislation, etc. So these people really make the future legislation, the future laws, the future advocates. And all these different levels are at one university. And then you also need, yeah, HR, human resources to, to scale them right and, yeah, not to have too much competition. And then you also have people who teach in this program, but also in this very high program. Then you have people who have to do their PhD. And yesterday we had also a meeting on all our yeah, labor law contracts. And also there we have, unfortunately, amazing differences, but this becomes also because our university is so colorful and so different. So there are a lot of challenges. And in the end, we never had enough money to attract yeah, full professors. I'm the only full professor of the university serving for all the faculties, but all other are extraordinary professors because for us, we realize when we fly in somebody, he's doing a proper job, teaching a good class, but the commitment, the bound with the university is not enough. And we realized we also need your yeah, high scale support in administration, in decision making. Now we are elaborating a new PhD reg reglement where we also would like to have the possibility for dual degrees, but also for a doctorate in business administration. So we need a lot of input. And therefore we elaborated the concept of extraordinary professors. So that are professors from elsewhere who are also committed in a zero contract, we not pay, <laughs> that they come here and teach with us and we pay up to six weeks stay and uh, yeah, the hotel, the, the travel costs and a car and a pair DM that they can eat something. And we have a wonderful set of seven professors in the meantime who really support four of our programs. And that's really a success story where we think that added such a lot because they feel much more committed and people also see them as permanent partners in it. So that's very important. And then throughout the last years, we also were more and more successful in getting European and other research funding. And that also brings in new moves. But uh, yeah, we still need a lot of more people who stay at the university. 
Recently, I made an inventory how many PhDs we had, and unfortunately, yeah, eight PhDs also left the university because then they, yeah, they earn much more when they go somewhere else. And most of them even left the island because it's much more attractive. So that remains a big, big problem to us. But as we are now so much focusing on PhD with a much better a tutoring, mentoring system on the island, and I really believe in mentoring. Also, when I became rector here, the first action I did was looking for two other female rectors elsewhere in the world and ask them to mentor me because you learn so much from each other. You face the same challenges and it doesn't make you know, wherever they are. So also, I think such a class like this, it, it's a network for your life. And that's so valuable. And yeah, we really believe here in stronger collaborations. And then also we realized, yeah, as more we focus on internationalization, as more attraction we also adhere in the whole region. And I'm always getting now requests from uh, students in the region, in Trinidad, Tobago, in Curaçao, in, in Colombia, can't we study in Aruba? And then we face the next problem as we are such a tourism uh, yeah, island, you can barely find a normal apartment for a fair price. So I'm now trying to build a dormitory with the help of the government and trying to find private investors. I've already got a plot of land and try to have a student house in the future so that we can also have more students from the region who participate in our English speaking programs. And we also have now the renovation going of the building next door yeah, with the uh, help of European Union fundings. And so we are yeah, steadily growing and try to be a full-fledged university. And I would love to show it to you one day. So that would be yeah, what I would love to share with you. Amazing, amazing. Thank you very much. From my point of view, it was motivational speech and uh, very innovative and uh, I hope really that uh, our fellows here can implement even some or, or use some of the ideas for their universities for the capacity building and uh, especially the importance of the international collaboration and all those opportunities that are out there, such as the Erasmus and Horizon program. Uh, at DSI, I have to mention that we are focused uh, this year on Erasmus. I have uh, personally prepared uh, three applications in K2 action of Erasmus Plus with um, mm -hmm. six European universities. And we submitted the applications and hopefully in two, three months uh, waiting to uh, for a positive outcome. And uh, it's especially the focus is on training the trainers in uh, many important areas for researchers su such as um, academic writing, communicating mm -hmm. science, um, support of mental health and academia and preventing some challenges and some problem solved uh, techniques as well. So I really hope that uh, we can um, find a common ground for uh, to extend our cooperation, including University of Aruba in the next uh, Erasmus calls. This could be some an idea and uh, we can discuss in details. Um, I would like to invite uh, the, the audience now to, to ask their questions. I have some questions, but I will give priority to the audience. So if someone wants to, to ask a question, please unmute your microphone and um, you're welcome to ask your question. If you are uh, more keen on asking the question, via the chat box, you can do it as well. You can write down in the chat box. Someone to break the ice. Hi. You gave the keyword mental health. That is something which is very important here on the island. As we it's unfortunately really have a lot of problems with sex harassment, with incest, and so on. So we will have the full scale of traumatized students. And that was also something which we realized that hindered our students' success. That students came from poverty, from family problems, not knowing their father and so on. And that caused a lot of problems. And when we made some surveys realizing why we have student dropout, because many also are caretakers of children, 17% of our students have children or caretakers for their families or other ill people. We realized a big, big
big reason why students don't perform is mental health. And also a big reason why, why lecturers uh, finally have a burnout is that the mental health was not taken care of. And we started some uh, three years ago, a big project with the support of Dutch funding, mental health for our students. And we made yeah, a color scheme. So we have some, some green activities, more capacity building, feeling stronger, reading faster. So things like that. Then we have something yellow. That's more you are in grief in a group and you work on that. Then we have orange where you really like individual, give people the, change to uh, the chance to change. And then we have red where they really are with a psychologist together. And in, in the beginning, people were very reluctant because it's also a taboo. Nobody wanted to talk about it. But when we made it so public and really with such a campaign, how much that helps to have success and also came with, with strong, tough examples, it opened up. And at the moment, a quarter of our students is participating in our mental health programs. Amazing. Uh, Dr. Thales Peroni wanted to ask a question. We cannot hear you. You can unmute your micro microphone, please. Huh? Yes. Okay, perfect. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, Viola. Uh, it, it was amazing uh, hear from you. And uh, my question is about uh, the research activities you are doing in the university or you are planning to do. Uh, here in Spain, I work in a, an observatory on environmental migration. And we are especially interested in, in the situation of uh, vulnerable uh, territories, uh, mainly uh, islands. No, so we are working with uh, in the region of South uh, China Sea, and the Caribbean uh, region. It's also very very important uh, in this topic. So my question is about uh, the research activities you are doing, and expect especially uh, the research on environmental uh, issues. Thank you. The focus of our studies lays in, the, in small island states, and there we have a lot on environmental issues too. But uh, we also have a, yeah, a research program in human rights, and what you name the refugees we have in more in the human rights area. And uh, our research on small islands is very manifold. On the one hand, we have several researchers in the area of waste management. On the other hand, how to yeah, keep uh, going that you have more nutrition from the island as now we import nearly everything we only produce 0.05 percent on the island so that's yeah we have some cucumbers we have some mango and some papaya and some pum yeah, pumpkin and there also we now look into possibilities to have their more efficient and not too many water consuming procedures to grow more on the island but that's very tricky as we have a soil which is mainly coral and we have not that much water and we, we even brew our beer here with unfiltered seawater, which then asks for a lot of electricity to clean up the water. So all these are issues that we are you're really looking what solutions need the island and then we are looking into research programs. And we also have a, a program, I look here for the book, where we invite uh, students of the University College in Utrecht, which is a very ambitious uh, student program. And uh, each year, these students have a full course where they do their research paper on a problem. We, from the beginning, say, oh, no, at this moment, we see we have whatever no information about the quality of the water in that area. We, we are fearing that this kind of animal species has no future. We see that we uh, yeah, need more own trees capable for this territory when we put some new. So we, we make a lot of lists of uh, research topics. These research students yeah, look which topic is fitting to them or even come with own topics. For half a year, they prepare their research question, make a desktop analysis, and then they come to Aruba and they get a twinning partner, an Aruban student and a supervisor. And then they carry out this research. So that's student research. And then each year we make a wonderful book of it, really that we give back to the society this knowledge. 
So there we have a lot of, and then the last years as there's more and more migration, we also set a strong focus on human rights and have also researchers in that area. This is refugees, not only of financial, but also environmental reasons. And then we also have uh, yeah, a lot of interest in the food sector because we had such a poverty program and during uh, COVID, high times when everything was closed, 28,000 people of Aruba were depending on the, how do you call it, the food bank, so that you get everyday food from the state, 28,000, you can't imagine that. And uh, so that was a big, big issue. And now we have also a program and yeah, how far this yeah, damage to society, this shortcoming of food for some time during COVID. And we also have a big program in how far can you yeah, encourage and reach people by small libraries all over the island in order to give access to knowledge, but also bring people together and upgrade slowly and also to maintain our multilingual environment so that people yeah, really start to read in Dutch, but also get this is a, the free Papiamento Grammatica everybody can get. It's also downloadable on the island. So we really try to bring yeah, knowledge closer to the people and that we also measure and have research on that. And our law faculty is mainly busy with this very delicate and difficult yeah, in, in our kingdom activities, because you must imagine this, a small kingdom of the Netherlands has five different legal systems and a high court in the Netherlands. Yeah, you can't end up with all the research you have to carry out. I'm also in the board of the law journal and yeah, we never have a shortcoming of subjects, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Viola. Thank you very much. Angel was asked whether we are going to share some information uh, of today's presentation. Uh, yeah, we all actually prepared the PowerPoint presentation. Uh, I think we will ask for permission to share with you. On, yes, on please. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Awesome. We will do it. Thank you very much. Sabah had asked, uh, concluded it was inspirational presentation. Yes, affiliated to remote yes. university in her country as well and yes. the same struggle are present. Uh, I can see that Geranda uh, raised her vir virtual hand and probably has a question so she can unmute her microphone. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Hello from The Hague. Thank you very much for this very interesting session. And it was very interesting, not only from what you have done from the, for the students, but also to increase the capabilities for the professors and so on. And my question would be if you can elaborate a bit more of all the program systems that you have uh, put in place to increase these capabilities. Yeah, I can do so. It's a full yeah, alphabet, as I already said. So first, we were thinking, yeah, what do we need to be a, to be a fair university? So we realized the most important thing is that our diplomas meet the standard which the students need when they like to follow up, for example, in the Netherlands with a master program. So that was our first focus that we always looked yeah, from the student side to really give those diplomas that we can say this is a quality that they should meet and that was where we started with the exam commission so we in the beginning we first trained the heads of the exam commissions then they realized yeah all my people in the exam commission also need more knowledge then we started with the exam commissions then out of that they realized oh yeah we got a lot of student evaluations but we don't give follow up on it then we looked into that how to implement here more these pdcr cycles that you control, plan, etc. Then we realized, okay, but also in the teaching, we sometimes on don't have a, a fair onboarding procedure because we are so understaffed. And when people come in the next day, they stand there and teach. And then we thought, oh no, that's not fair. <laughs> we should at least give a tutor. So now when a new person comes, he always get a twin, a more senior lecturer who will at least uh, yeah do co-teaching co or for I system for all exams. So we really started from that area. Then we realized, yeah, also the teaching capacity is, is not there. Even when you have some knowledge, teaching is something different than only sharing your knowledge. Then we started with what, yeah, what's in Dutch known as a BKO, Bas Qualifikatie Onderweis, so teaching, education. But then we realized we have so many part-time lecturers who can't come to the university. 
And then we asked around at other universities, how do you do that? How do you do that? And then University of Curacao said, we have an online program for part-time lecturers in English. And it's okay, can we join? And now we are doing together with University of Curacao this education program in the evenings for lecturers all over. Then we realized we have some people who speak really only Dutch and others only English. So we now also offer everything in either Dutch or English. Then we realized through the COVID that we couldn't fly in all people and that we needed complete new skills to teach online. And we already prepared earlier all our classroom with Zoom facilities and screens and all that. But during COVID, that really came in a, in a very fast way, the new method. But also there we realized that, yeah, everything, Zoom, et cetera, offers so much more. And also the technical skills of our people were not in line. So we offered a, a basis a qualification and digitalization. And that was very interesting because out of this course, this was really in the beginning, focusing on teaching only, people realized so much more like, oh, can't we have an electronic dossier of uh, our own contract history and what we are doing in courses. So we also amended that and then also asked around inside the university, which digital skills you have, you could teach. And um, it was amazing how many people popped up who had special specific skills. And then, then we also put something new on it, like doing your, yeah, your tax uh, registration online. So everything on the island, what was online, we also taught. And it was a big success and a high number of the staff who participated. But that also then, then grew as a community that people were seeing, oh, they really add something also to my life. And then they were also open to follow some other classes. Now we also elaborate this on, on research, on leadership. And now yeah, yesterday I started to make also a program that deans who are recently appointed that they also get a training because as a dean, you're in charge of the budget, you are in charge of your human resource. You are also should have an eye who should grow, who should get extra capacity and possibilities. And all that you put now also in a kind of course to let the deans be better prepared for their tough job. And so we're looking all around, but it's a really work in progress. Thank you very much. Anyone else? Yeah, Professor. Yes, Professor, good evening. Hi, I cannot uh, see. Good afternoon, Professor. Hi, who is, who is talking? I cannot. I'm uh, Dr. Olga Mbam. Ah, hi, Olga. Uh, thank you, folks. Uh, I'm happy and then uh, thank you for the presentation uh, to the professor. As the vice rector of the university, I just want to know, you know, in Africa, we usually focus, now that we are in globalization, we always focus on uh, uh, European economy and to see, or develop economic, to see how they manage to, 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 to to, to, to be where they are today. I just want to know if in their university, in her university, are they uh, sitting or focused to the, to, on in developed economy to just a way to see how to help or to accompany our economies to catch up with uh, developed economies. In brief, a, I just want mm -hmm. to know if uh, in your university you people are teaching about the economic development. It's another way to, to ask the question. Thank you very much for this question. That was something which kept me very much busy because in the beginning when I came here, I realized that we are still in the colonial mode, let's say, that we are still here, the small satellite island, and always looking what are the Netherlands doing, what are the Netherlands doing, and what is Europe doing, and I thought, no, that's not right, we should be strong how we are, as we are, and for example, we will in October also host a conference turning the tide on small islands, and we invited all small islands all over the world to the Pacific, etc. And we hope to have at least some 150 people here and also online talks on these small islands and share our experience. And I also looked for strong partnerships in Colombia 
and at the University of West Indies in Trinidad. As I think, yeah, we are all so unique and our uniqueness, it's good to, to share knowledge with other unique universities and not always look to your historical partner from the past. So we are now also much more broadening up our view on internationalization and looking, yeah, on the one hand, in the region, we are already, yeah, a top institution, I can yeah, very proud say when I sometimes at meetings of universities here in the region, where some ask for our help and we can be the helping hand and say we have experience in this, we already have a mental health program, we share the information and we can do the reach out. On the other hand, we know that we still have a lot to learn and then we are looking to the US or to, to um, the Netherlands. Belgium. But on the other hand, we also learn a lot from the region because some of our capacity problem, transportation problems, that's more that you link much better. We are still busy now with the review of our program and economy. And there we had contact with many, many partners all over the world. But we feel felt immediately click with universities in Colombia, as they are also innovative, they face the same economic challenges. And then we really thought after 10 minutes, wow, this is the partner because we share a common yeah, daily life. And that's also very important. So I think it's always good to have a look. And also when we set up this conference on small states, we met so many new partners where we immediately thought, yeah, we share the same story. Wonderful, I fully agree. Uh, thank you very much. If anyone has the last question, is welcome to ask. If not, I would like to, I cannot see if someone raising a hand, no, probably. I am, if again? I might. Yeah, again. Okay. <laughs> so, I do have a second question and the last one, I promise. I heard throughout your presentation that throughout the years you had also issues and lacking resources providing uh, lecturing and so on. Is there any specific request for this audience for us as postdoctorate students to support you? And with, if yes, with what kind, with, with what ways, research collaboration or online teaching, I don't know, what is needed in your university and what it is the most uh, urgent from your side? Oh, wonderful question. So I'm looking at the moment for a language teacher who can really teach academic English or Spanish or Papiamento or Dutch, and in the best case, two of these languages, immediately I would hire that person. And then okay. I'm looking for a real strong team leader for our social work program. So that would be my big dream to have say, a very motivated person, but with also the struggle, you need to know Spanish, you need to know Papiamento, and you need to know yeah, English. Papiamento you could probably learn, but Spanish and English must be a must. Then I'm looking at this moment for a manager finance for the world, yeah, budgeting of the university. And really their manager who's also very strategic, looks what other possibilities, how we can proceed. Then I'm looking at for a human resource manager at the moment. I'm looking for a coordinator for our lifelong learning center, where we also like to offer a kind of Studium Generale, which is our outreach to society, but also we yeah, are our bridge to bring people to the university who otherwise would not find it. So these are my needs, urgent needs at the moment. And yeah, we would need also some more teaching capacity, mainly in the area of social work. And we will also have the need of a new senior member in the area of finance for our economic faculty. So we have many, many open vacancies. And even on top of that, we need even more people than you will find on the vacancies on our website. Lovely. Please apply. <laughs> we would like to have more PhDs. At the moment at our university, we only have 18 people holding a PhD, only 18, and have seven study programs. You can imagine, what kind of struggle that is for us to offer high quality education with only so few people in house who have the right qualification. Lovely. Here are 33 people with doctoral degrees, doctorate degrees from over 20 countries from everywhere. So let's see what future brings, who knows? Yeah, but I also would love to have if somebody of you 
what are, is the feature of the postdoc? Because that's for me always a struggle to tell my minister that I say, no, this is something you can't make a person holding a PhD immediately a professor and only let him teach. And that he says, yeah, but that's why they have a PhD because then you have the accreditation easier for the master. I said, no, a postdoc offers more. It's also, yeah, for the research so important because you can focus on urgent problems, but this pe person can also develop as being an excellent teacher, a real good teacher, because when you only did your PhD, you do normally don't have the teaching skills already. And if somebody could help me to, to bring together a good position paper of the value of postdocs, I would be very happy. Wonderful. There are various programs. Uh, mainly it is uh, the, the postdoctoral programs are focused on a uh, strict area of research where the candidate is doing research several years connect, affiliated to a university. This is a program particularly intending to uh, for capacity building, for networking opportunities, and for acquiring skills that are constantly changing on the on the market and demanding in order to um, uh, prepare the, the researchers for, for their future academic prospects and to uh, enhance their careers. That's the, the main idea and the main focus. And that's why we are providing different types of events in hybrid modes in order to uh, make one, let's say, cocktail of academic activities that will strengthen the, the skills and the competences of, of the postdoctoral candidates. Thank you very much. Uh, once again, Viola, uh, we keep in touch. We will share the, the presentation with the candidates and uh, I'm wishing you all the best here from the sunny Skopje in Macedonia, 25 degrees. It's already summer. <laughs> Okay, wonderful. That sounds good. We have 29 degrees, so you're very close by. Permanent, and probably, yeah. Our well, annual report in two months, and there you can really read all about our university in new figures. Awesome. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you Bye -bye. to you. Bye. Bye. -bye. Thank you.